we were hesitant to acknowledge the, as it as it grew. We wanted to promote home staking as the best solution. Liquid staking, a whole lot more competitive than running a validator where you don't get any capital back. You can't reuse that capital and, and like add add risk to it to get extra reward. One of the things that we don't want in staking is colluding operators. We don't want Coinbase and Kraken to work together. We want them to be adversarial. 30% of the um, stake ETH is in Lido. That means that they are a sort of a systemic risk in Ethereum. Can we slow down the amount of stake coming in knowing that the majority of this is not the most valuable form of staking? There are changes being proposed to sort of favor home stakers and favor more decentralized forms of staking. Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Friederike Ernst, and today I'm speaking with Superfizz and Nixo, who are the co-founder and executive director, respectively, of um, the Reddit community eStaker. So, before we talk about Reddit and staking and everything in between, let me tell you about our sponsors this week. This episode is brought to you by Gnosis. Gnosis builds decentralized infrastructure for the Ethereum ecosystem. With a rich history dating back to 2015 and products like Safe, CowSwap, or Gnosis Chain, Gnosis combines needs-driven development with deep technical expertise. This year marks the launch of Gnosis Pay, the world's first decentralized payment network. With a Gnosis card, you can spend self-custody crypto at any visa-accepting merchant around the world. If you're an individual looking to live more on-chain or a business looking to white-label the stack, visit GnosisPay.com. There are lots of ways you can join the Gnosis journey. Drop in the Gnosis DAO governance form, become a Gnosis validator with a single GNO token and low-cost hardware, or deploy your product on the EVM-compatible and highly decentralized Gnosis chain. Get started today at Gnosis.io. Cars One is one of the biggest node operators globally and help you stake your tokens on 45 plus networks like Ethereum, Cosmos, Celestia, and DYDX. More than 100,000 delegators stake with Cars One, including institutions like BitGo and Ledger. Staking with Cars One not only gets you the highest yields, but also the most robust security practices and infrastructure that are usually exclusive for institutions. You can stake directly to Chorus One's public node from your wallet, set up a white label node, or use the recently launched product, Opus, to stake up to 8,000 ETH in a single transaction. You can even offer high yield staking to your own customers using their API. Your assets always remain in your custody, so you can have complete peace of mind. Start staking today at chorus.one. Nixo and Superfizz, it's a and it's an absolute pleasure to have both of you on. It's uh, kind of we've haven't we haven't had a staking episode in a while. So tell me about yourselves. Uh, hey, so I'm Superfizz. I um, have been an Ethereum since the Olympic test net. Actually, since before that, since I read uh, Vitalik's um, paper. Uh, introduced smart contracts to me, totally didn't understand it, but I had this kind of gut feeling. Um, and I've just been curious about Ethereum since then. Uh, around 2018, I got interested in proof of stake. That was about the time that uh, the first model got discarded where it was stake 1500 ETH. Um, and <laughs> it was it was totally reworked. And um, i quit my job and I was like, I'm going to promote staking. Like it's the thing that I want to do. I, I felt passionate about it. Um, and so probably since 2018, I have been just obsessed with promoting uh, proof of stake on Ethereum. So that's me. What was your job before you quit it? So as I was a school psychologist and a school counselor. Um, I worked with kids and I loved it. But uh, that's actually that's actually weirdly in tune with kind of what you do for the Ethereum ecosystem, too. It's kind of like uh, it's funny. I didn't think things, so right? at first. Yeah. At first, I, I was like, I'm not I'm not, I, you know, I got a C in uh, intro to computer science. I I 
I've been a nerd my entire life and I've always been uh, into technology, into computers. Um, but yeah, I, I took psychology classes because they were easy and uh, easy for me. And they're not you know easy for everyone, but they were it, it was in tune with what I know. Um, and so I did this career uh, working with kids and um, I, I was a guidance counselor and I do. I see a lot of parallels now between guiding community, working with people, encouraging people, being supportive um, and sort of uh, seeing the path forward. So, yeah, there, there are a lot of a lot of beneficial parallels. Everyone can't be a developer. Yeah. Think of the others. What would happen if everyone were to use guests? It's like it's like it's very parallel to kind of like yeah, absolutely yeah no and I think kind of the the ecosystem absolutely needs uh, many many non devs ma mainly non devs actually but uh, yeah what about you Nixo? Um, so I was like very very loosely into crypto before I ever heard of staking before um, staking ever launched but. Um, at some point I was just buying, um, Ethereum and I kept seeing this number 32 thrown around and I was like, what is this number? I'm very curious about this number. And mostly I saw it from, um, from Superfizz because we were both part of the e-finance community, which is another, um, Ethereum community on, on Reddit. Um, and so I got, I learned how to stake myself. Um, and, um, at some point I started answering a lot of questions in the e-staker subreddit and Superfizz reached out to me and was like, you're very helpful. Can you can can we can we get you to help more? Can we get you more involved? Um, and so I got involved through eStaker. Um, and I used to be um, an an oceanographer, and I actually left my job in oceanography because I was getting really into staking and really into this ecosystem, and I wanted to throw myself in completely. If I can follow up on that, the I, I have always and to this day, and even in this this talk. Nixo answers things the way that I wish that I could. And so we, she, even in Reddit, uh, Twitter, wherever, um, uh, you know, I answer and I'm satisfied with my answer. And then I read Nixo's answer. I'm like, damn, I wish I had said it that way. Uh, so I, the reason I'm so excited to uh, promote and encourage her is because uh, we're on the, on the same wavelength in so many ways, but she has an ability to say things better than I might've said them. So that's, that's my excitement. That is such a wonderful compliment. Uh, I I really like that. So, uh, Superfus. So when when you kind of quit your job as the school guidance counselor, how did you finance yourself? I mean, were you already very long ETH, or kind of how 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 did this kind of? I mean, obviously most people kind of have to make a living. So, kind of promoting staking on Ethereum is probably not one of the jobs in the school guidance counselors list of jobs that you recommend to students. So how, how, how did that play out? Yeah, that's interesting. And I don't think I've ever actually answered this before. Um, it, it was crypto. Um, I, I also held Bitcoin and Ether and um, I had uh, several Dash master nodes um, early, or they were dark coin <laughs> and then Dash. Um, and I... I really that year reached a point with my crypto investments, and this is around 2018, that um, I felt like my daily volatility was higher than my annual income. And that that was just weird to me. I'm like, why am I doing, you know, what this, which I loved it. I did it for 15 years. It was very rewarding, but it, it wasn't financially rewarding. And um I felt like I could I could make a bigger impact and a better you know a bigger impact in the world through promoting staking than um, continuing to do this uh, you know really non financially rewarding thing and since that time I've I've I, and I haven't had any any jobs but I've I've had uh, you know arrangements that that have that have supported me. Um, it has worked out really well. Like, I mean, airdrops um, or even just staking, like staking still doesn't, I, I don't, I don't have enough ETH that staking pays all of my bills, but it is a, a very nice foundation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so kind of when you came into this topic of staking, this was before the transition to proof of stake, right? So how has, how has the staker 
enthusiast community or the staker community actually changed since? It, it has been a, I would call it a dramatic transition. In, in the beginning, uh, 32 Ether was not that expensive. And I, I can't really quote a price, but it was a couple thousand dollars. Uh, and so really anyone who, or most people who were deeply committed could buy a full validator and a staker. Um, with the changes in price and really onboarding more people who are speculative in nature rather than technical in nature, there has been a shift toward focusing on returns rather than focusing on securing the network. So this long shift has been away from individual stakers and toward, um, you know, LSDs, simple deposits, restaking, whatever pays the, the highest um, APY. And I don't think it was unpredictable, but uh, I, I guess I sort of hoped it would take longer than it has. What, what sort of um, topics are currently uh, the mainstay of East Sticker? Nick, I'll let you, uh, I, I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little, um, I have turned more toward mainstream Ethereum the past few months, um, and Nix is still very deep in staking, so I, I think you'd be better for... So yeah, I'm full, I'm full-time, I'm the only person who's full-time at eStaker right now, um, so I would say that the main, the main things on eStaker are, or in staking in general, is just making sure that staking is accessible for people, and so... I actually, I, I just put out um, a survey of, of stakers because we were curious to see like what their pain points were and um, sort of what's, what stumbling blocks. And I I do have some, we were talking about like this, uh, the makeup of stakers earlier. We were talking about like their technical backgrounds or the technical capabilities. And I actually do have some statistics from the survey. Um, and it is, it is quite large, like 90 Ninety percent of people consider themselves um, having a technical background in staking, uh, or a technical background. Ninety percent of people in staking consider themselves to have a technical background. So, um, while it does like it involve some um, technical capability, people still need a lot of help troubleshooting, and people do wish there was some sort of plug and play option that you could just plug in and like earn money with. But the fact. The fact sort of is like you are at this point throwing down a hundred thousand dollars into a validator. Um, and so I, I think now um, the biggest the biggest hurdle that we sort of need to overcome is the fact that um, and this is a really big topic that we're probably going to get into is that uh, the economies of scale are really hard to overcome. and we're seeing um, staking pools, liquid staking tokens, um, and big professional operators uh, benefit more from staking than home stakers are. And it's it's making home stakers feel sort of like sidelined, feel sort of like staking isn't meant for them. And like um, they might be pushed out eventually because the as the APR continues to go down, um, they're just less competitive than these big staking operations that can put up with lower APR for some period of time because they're not necessarily relying on what the APR is, they're relying on the fees that they're taking from the people who are delegating their stake to them. Um, okay, maybe let's, let's kind of, there, there's a lot to unpack here. So maybe kind of let's look into the different ways that staking happens, right? Say, say I have 32 ETH. So in principle, I could run my own validator. Um, if I don't want to do that, what are my alternatives? So if you don't want to run your own validator, you can definitely use a staking pool. And that is the option that most people are taking because th that means you don't have to be engaged in the ecosystem at all. You can take your um, your capital, you throw it into a staking pool, they give you a liquid staking token back, and then you can take that liquid staking token and walk it over to DeFi for some extra yield, which makes liquid staking a whole lot more competitive than running a validator where you don't get any capital back. You can't reuse that capital and, and like add add risk to it to get extra reward. Um, but there are also other options. Like so 32 ETH is the minimum amount for a validator, but there are other protocols coming online that lower that financial barrier. And um, these these have been a long time in the making. The the one that's live right now is Rocket Pool and that lowers the barrier to eight ETH plus uh, 2.4 ETH of uh, 2.4 worth of their their token in ETH, um, and so 
that sort that sort of uh, lowers the financial barrier, but it doesn't really lower the technical barrier. They have their own um, software that lowers the technical barrier a little bit, but you still need to be be using command line. But our big thing is we do want people running from home. Like we don't necessarily want people throwing things in delegating capital because there's enough of that going on, and that's actually become really problematic. So. I will I will just say like if people want to run from home the technical barrier is a lot lower than people on Twitter seem to think it is. Um I think that people see command line and it scares them and I am not I'm not a super technical person. I came from science. Um not coding and I don't know how to code and um I I managed to do it. <laughs> One of the really interesting things I heard you acknowledge is that you can get more right now from delegating your ETH to someone else um, and, you know, going through restaking or uh, or depositing it for yield. That is something that we, we, me, us, we were hesitant to acknowledge as it, as it grew. We wanted to promote home staking as the best solution, as the most valuable solution, the most rewarding solution. And only by acknowledging that the playing field is, is disparate, that you can make more through an LSD. Um, that's the only way that we can uh, tackle the situation and, and begin to improve it. And that's, I'm, I'm it's a difficult acknowledgement, uh, but it also brings the ability to change it. It also, like, I have trouble with that because um, so many people come into crypto as as is normal, um, just wanting to sort of gamble, so, wa- wanting to make some money. Um, and I would say 95% of this ecosystem is um, throwing darts at a board, hoping to make it rich. But I I believe in Ethereum as something that can level the playing field, something that could possibly like mitigate the wealth gap by by reducing the amount that economies of scale are able to um, bring you to. And I I think that it's very, very important that we pay attention to how staking grows up and how the consensus layer and the base the base protocol of Ethereum grows up in order to preserve that because I think that blockchain can actually like actually has the potential to be really dystopian if we have this insanely efficient surveillance system, but we don't have a way f- to protect against it being captured by just a few entities. Um, and so I think that staking is the fundamental way to protect, making sure that staking is decentralized is the fundamental way to protect that right now. And so um, the fact that you can make more on an LST right now is is a little devastating because um, it means that we're losing this fight against um, against making Ethereum anti-monopolistic there are changes in the there are changes being proposed to sort of favor home stakers and favor more decentralized forms of staking that um i am i am uh very much in support of and i hope that uh they get a lot more support because i do still think that ethereum can be this really ideal um end game where the financial system is run in a much more equitable way can I high five you in the screen? Is that sorry? That's see, that's why I listen to her. Sorry. <laughs> let's let's talk about liquid staking. So kind of like the liquid staking kind of it means you can kind of delegate um less than 32 ETH to kind of say Lido. Um and uh, basically they will um generate yield on that for you, but at the same time you get a liquid token back that you can use, uh, for instance, as collateral in, say, a a lending pool where you can kind of uh, borrow, say, ETH against this again, and you can stake ETH. So basically, you can kind of generate yield on this multiple times, which you can't if you're a home staker, right? So which is why, um, in addition to kind of being technologically much, much easier, because you just have to press it it's just pressing a button, right? I mean, basically, anyone who has used Lido, it's very easy to use. So in addition um, to being easier, it's also more lucrative, which is why pretty much around 30% of all staked ETH currently is in Lido. So kind of, kind of, can you walk us 
through the issues that this kind of presents? Yeah. Um, so it's it's definitely more lucrative, but it's also more risky. Um, the, when you stake, all your your risk is um, with the beacon chain contract and or with the staking contract, and that's it. Um, when you are using a liquid staking token, um, your risk is with the um, staking contract, with the protocol, with um, the smart contract of the liquid staking token. And so it introduces a lot more um, risk into the protocol. And when we have a situation right now, like um, like Lido has 30% of the um, staked ETH is in Lido. And um, that means that they are a sort of a systemic risk in Ethereum. And so if um, there was a bug in the Lido staking contract, uh, that would not just be an issue for the people holding liquid staking tokens. It would be an issue for all of Ethereum, for everybody who's holding Ethereum, for the entire crypto ecosystem, because Ethereum is such a large part of the crypto ecosystem. Um, and so it would be one of those situations that you see in the news where it's like some large collapse that um, and people who had open positions get liquidated. Um, and so this is not just an issue for stakers. This is not just an issue for ETH holders. This is an issue for the entire crypto ecosystem. Fisk, like, can you think of any? I, I wanted to piggyback on that. I was trying not to cut you off, but there, there's a more long term and transcendental risk as well that comes from that kind of centralization. It is that uh, adoption stagnates over the long term. It's that when um, nation states, when corporations, when three letter agencies look at Ethereum, they they're actively evaluating to determine whether it is a um, a truly decentralized platform. Can we operate on this platform or can we manipulate it maybe? And uh, for for those actors to have the confidence that Ethereum is a truly decentralized platform, we need to ensure that there aren't these large actors who could control the network. And that feeds into our long-term value, into our 20 or 30 year value, um, because the failure of those large actors to adopt because we're centralized will have this long-term negative effect, but it's not obvious right now. Right now, you know, you're seeing, hey, I'm getting, you know, 10% APY, but that that sacrifices our long-term ability to uh, to, to dig into uh, the potential uh, user base. Fizz, when you say con control the network, what exactly do you mean? Do you mean kind of like censor people or take away funds from people or what's what's kind of the threat scenario here? Hyperbole. At, at 30%, um, I would say that there is uh, no technical risk. But um, in 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 the long run, if, if Lido continues to grow, and one of the things, honestly, I try not to talk about them too much. I, I, I'm not interested in giving them a, a lot more um, publicity, but they're developing, uh, I think it's called Lido Alliance, and they are um, organizing other operators as, as kind of a cohort. And one of the things that we don't want in staking is colluding operators. We don't want uh, a large, we don't want, you know, Coinbase and Kraken to work together. We want them to be adversarial, maybe friendly, but, but adversarial still so that they're not colluding to make decisions later. If there's an, a large alliance of stakers, um, a formal alliance of stakers, then they have these back channels where they can say, hey, um, you know, I don't I don't like this initiative. Can we shut this down at the developer level? Um, or, hey, can you get your people to vote for this? Um, or, or if they even were able to control 50 or 66 percent through this kind of collaboration collusion, um, it is possible that they could change the future of the network. Uh, and so it, it is not. I can't call it a a current threat. It is a potential threat that is continuing to grow. And that's that's why we're cautious of it. OK, yeah, so I see that. So Nick, so you said earlier that there are ways of kind of that are being discussed of making um, solo staking more attractive. Um, can you go into those a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So um, 
There are uh, lots of different variables that can be messed with in order to make decentralized forms of staking uh, more attractive, but uh, there is not a um, full-fledged proposal right now. Um, our best proposal right now is basically saying all of the new new stake that's coming in, um, of all of the new stake that's coming in, 90% of it is coming from liquid staking protocols, from staking pools right now. And so um, we are trending upwards. We have not we have not seen a dip in um, in the demand for staking. Like I think right now the queue just emptied out. Uh, the staking queue, the number of validators coming in every epoch, just emptied out for the first time in um, maybe more than a year. So the the staking queue, the amount of staked ETH, um, people throwing capital in, has been up only. And so there is a potential. There's there's potentially a situation where we end up at 99.9% ETH staked. And in that situation, because we know that the majority of the uh, the home stakers, the people who are um, the most decentralized forms of staking, uh, came early on to the beacon chain, uh, and they represent now a small, a very small amount of the new stake coming in, can, can we slow down the amount of stake coming in knowing that the majority of this is not the most valuable um, uh, form of staking. So this this change is um, the the name of this really contentious thing is issuance changes. Um, and so it's basically the reason it's so contentious is is because it's basically changing the monetary policy of Ethereum, saying we're going to um, change how how uh, Ethereum issues ETH to the people who are securing the chain in order to slow down stake. And what this is, is a mitigation uh, proposal for, for it's an intermediate proposal for a proposal coming later on. And the, the thing that, the things that can be in that proposal later on are um, messing with a, with a number of different variables to make decentralized forms of staking more attractive. So right now, this is just a simple issue and the, the um, proposal that exists right now, uh, lowering issuance, is just a si very simple change. It's just lowering issuance so that staking is less attractive in the in the um, like right now, um, so that we can propose something later on. What can come later on is something like um, correlated staking, uh, correlated offline penalties, and so this is something Vitalik uh, proposed, and. Um, but basically, right now, what we have is correlated slashing penalties. So if somebody attacks the network, somebody has a thousand validators that all double sign on something or all try to change something on the network, we see that they have a thousand validators and we slash all of them. The network, the consensus rules slash all of them um, and apply this apply this um, factor to it saying, uh, a lot of validators got slashed at once. It looks like you guys are colluding, so we're going to slash more of your capital than it would if it was if you were just one staker who like messed up and double signed and, or, or did something silly. Um, and so what we could do is apply that correlation factor to people who are staking. So say uh, I'm a professional operator who runs ten thousand validators, and I have a power blip, and my state goes offline for 10 minutes and I missed two attestations. Um, the network could see that uh, 10,000 validators missed two attestations and apply a correlation penalty to that stake uh, that says this stake all looks like it's run by the same operator. So we're gonna up, we're gonna give you a, a harsher penalty. And that that would um, preferentially benefit small stakers because they wouldn't experience that correlation penalty. And so that's just that's one of the things that could be applied to the eventual change that um, that we are trying to um, that we would like to uh, implement some e intermediate change um, that gave us time to implement that. It's worth saying that uh, even even among people who are deeply aligned, like even with people that we share a lot of values with that we see ethereum the same way there's a lot of um a lot of consternation about this because it changes the monetary supply because it, for some people there was a promise to users that you know this is how things were going to go forward um but nixon and i 
don't necessarily see that there has been any promise to anyone. We see that this is an emerging technology and that we ought to um, continue to de develop it and really kind of shepherd it and safeguard it until it is uh, really hardened and calcified over the long run. And if you look at these proposals, like the the majority of the criticism that you see, at least the where the criticism originates, if you look at the people who are um, most strongly criticizing that, a lot of them are associated with liquid staking pools. And so like that sort of tells you that you're hitting the right pain points. But then they bring out these arguments that are like, oh, this will hurt solo staking or this isn't good for the network. And it's a scare tactic. It, Won't it's you a scare pick up the children? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it scares the rest of Ethereans because they're being told this this proposal is the end of the world. Um, and the amount of sort of capital that you see going into um, so propping up those concerns uh, is concerning right now because right now the financial interest in preventing those changes is the least it will ever be from now on is the is the minimum that it will be from now on as as we get further and further along this stake rate like right now we're at 30 percent we could be at 40 percent in six months we could be at 50 percent in eight months um that criticism will only go up and it will be harder and harder to implement changes that hurt the people who are benefiting best from the system right now um, the people who are benefiting most from the system right now have the most financial interest to stop these changes because the incumbents like to keep things like the status quo because that's who is benefiting. <laughs> and it's funny because their arguments, their arguments don't sound selfish. Their arguments are, this will harm home stakers. You must hate home stakers if you want to do this because home stakers are are the most valuable thing and you would harm this by doing this. And those arguments come from uh, constituents who do don't actually represent home stakers, but that is their argument. And they're, they're doing things like working to get developers on the core developers call. Like we, we need to do more research and include our developers in, in the, the core devs call. Those are the kind of tactics that uh, they're, they're, they're designed in the long term to derail something that is really better for the network in favor of their interest. There, there are home stakers who are uh, against these changes, and I don't want to. I don't want to dismiss their concerns because um, there are. I know I personally know home stakers who are against these changes, um, and some of them run thousands of validators. But I, I would also argue that somebody who runs thousands of validators as a home staker is just as valuable as somebody who runs one one validator. What we're really looking for is is millions of validators all around the world. Yeah, can, can you clarify the exact intermittent proposal again? So basically, is it to kind of um, cut off new people from staking or lower the staking rewards for everyone who's currently staking and will be staking in the future? So basically, is it is it kind of leveling the playing field or is it just kind of drawing a line where you say everyone who staked before this point is still good and everyone after? No, that that would be terrible. That w We acknowledge that that would be terrible. So basically, you have an x-axis and a y-axis, and this is the amount of stake that, uh, or the amount of APR that people are getting. The less stake uh, that is in the system, the more APR pe people get. And so that's just taking this curve and moving it down. So it's just lowering APR. So, okay, everyone gets less. Yes. Uh, up to 100% stake ETH, there's still an APR. There's a return, and it, it could be lower and lower. What we're really interested in is um, changing that curve so that around 30% of stake, 25% of stake, that uh, rewards, this is complex terminology, rewards actually become negative. So the closer you get to 25, 27%, whatever that, that sweet spot is, um, your rewards trickle down to, you know, 1%, 0.1%, zero, and then a negative return. And yes, that will cause some people, some entities to withdraw from the network. Um, we, we believe, and there are really two interesting angles on this. We believe that that will lower interest in liquid staking tokens um, and that 
many home validators will still survive that. Uh, so it is a cut, but it is uh, a, a beneficial long-term cut. And the other side of that is, if if a maximum of 30% of Ether are staked, then Ether holders, Ether is still the currency of Ethereum. Um, staking or an LST provider that controlled 80% of staked ETH does not control the network. Ethereum holders who hold the other 70% of, of Ether, they are still the stewards of the network, uh, not someone who holds a third-party token uh, that is that is, you know, then the that is potentially the money of ether, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. So is is the idea that um, the network security doesn't benefit from kind of people who, for, from the thirty first to the ninety ninth percentile of ETH staked? So basically, if every single ETH were to be staked, wouldn't make the network any more secure than say if a third of ETH were staked. That is correct. Um, we don't have an exact number, and that is a criticism. We don't have an exact number for what is needed to secure the network. I've heard estimates that are anywhere from one percent to twelve percent of all staked um, of all ether needs to be staked in order to secure the network. We're at thirty something percent. Everything above this is superfluous, and everything above this serves validators. And validators aren't meant to be served by the network; they are in service of the network. Okay. And so basically, um, you just said that kind of the APR depends on kind of where you are on this act. So how many, how many people are, how many validators are staking at the same time, right? So basically, but everyone makes the same APR regardless of when they started. So basically, if more people come online, then everyone gets less, right? That's kind of the, the basic mechanism. Correct. Okay. Then let's talk about kind of solo stakers and what an ideal network kind of what it would look like. So basically, having outlined kind of all of the drawbacks of being a solo staker, um, you need to have like some technical background, even if you're not a dev, kind of at least you have to be kind of like happy using command line and so on. Um, and I mean, there are also somewhat plug and play systems. So kind of you could buy a dap node or a Nevado and kind of it's, it's not really like you plug it in um, in the power source and you're good, but kind of it it lowers kind of the barrier to kind of entry for um, for people. So um, the large capital requirement side. So those are people who kind of have a hundred thousand dollars in ETH lying around. Who stakes and why do they stake themselves? So um, I would say the people who stake are the people who want um, low risk returns. Low people who have low risk returns and people who are um, at least technically uh, confident enough to know that they can copy and paste from a guide. Um, they can use command line if it's copying and pasting from a guide. Um, like I said, 90% of stakers um, consider themselves technically competent. It also, one of the big barriers is internet connection is bandwidth. Um, and so we do see that 95% uh, of people who report staking, who, who report um, are either from North America, Europe, or Australia. We see very few stakers in Latin America. We see almost no stakers in Africa. Um, there are some in Southeast Asia. Singapore is a hotspot for uh, node operators. And, and again, that's, that's a lot about the capital requirement, but um, a lot of that is about the network requirement too, because um, I'm, in, I'm in South America right now. Um, here in South America, it's harder to um, have a stable internet connection outside of very urban regions. I'm in Buenos Aires and Buenos Aires has um, great internet, but outside of this very small capital, 50% of the country is in poverty and um, they, they're just not serviced. They don't have the infrastructure that's needed to, um, even if they could procure a hundred thousand dollars or whatever the, um, minimum requirement is for a protocol that lowers the financial barrier, they couldn't necessarily set up a node that could keep up with the, with the bandwidth requirements. But a home staker in your definition is someone who actually runs the physical infrastructure at home. So kind of, if I were to have like an AWS node, I wouldn't be a home staker, is that correct? You wouldn't be a home staker, but you would be a remote staker. I still I still consider those valuable players. They're not as valuable as a home staker because they somebody could turn off their node. 
Um, but if if you're running um, a stake a staking node that is in AWS or Cloudflare or any uh, Contabo or any like service that gives you um, your the bare metal service or cloud service, um, you're still running the configuration of your node, and I still consider that valuable. You you wrote a great disambiguation of that. Um, where is that? It's on um, Eastaker's paragraph blog. Fantastic. We'll link to that in the show notes. It is a she gives a great um, distinction. I I don't recall seeing remote staker on there, but it, it really does break down uh, the different kinds of stakers and the value they provide to the network. I was impressed with that. Okay, so let's look at kind of a healthy staking ecosystem, right? So basically, what you want to avoid is that. Um, um, nodes are too correlated with each other. So kind of there's different dimensions that we can think of that kind of they could be correlated in. So kind of there's very physical ones like uh, location and jurisdiction. So kind of you could have a natural disaster, say um, an earthquake or a volcano. You could have a jurisdictional black swan event where, for instance, I don't know, the government says everyone who stakes um, uh, ETH is, uh, provides a security and if you don't turn it off right now, we will come after you sort of thing. And then th there's using cloud providers, right? So basically, if everyone uses AWS, then kind of obviously kind of the bottleneck here is AWS. And I mean, if you look at what cloud providers are out there, there's a, basically there's AWS and Google Cloud and Hetzner, and then everything else comes like, you know, very distant third, fourth. Um, then there's clients, right? So basically we have beacon and execution chain clients. Um, so kind of if you have a client bug and kind of say 50% of the network use a single client, then obviously that part of the network would come down. So how do you see all of these dimensions, which are critical at the moment, um, which are you paying attention to, when, which are we doing okay on? I would like to let Nick's answer, but I... I also want to include uh, that social coordination, and that is uh, that collusion between multiple operators. Um, but yeah, and Nick, you're, you're probably more attuned to answer the whole question. I would say let's let's do three major categories: software, software diversity, hardware diversity, geographic diversity. But software diversity is talking about the consensus layer clients, the execution layer clients, and that is. That's a really easy fix for node operators where you run a campaign that basically says like run a minority client because um, there are all these terrible things that can happen if uh, if everybody is running the same consensus or execution layer client. And that's that's often misunderstood as like an altruistic endeavor. Like, oh, if I wanted to be selfish, I would run the super majority client and I would be fine. But that's not how it works. You put yourself at risk if you are running a super majority client. So I think the Ethereum community has actually shown a great deal of um, motivation in changing that. And Fizz sort of led the um, the initial call for consensus layer client diversity. Um, and then there's hardware diversity. And I think we're I think we're actually doing great on that. Um, in terms of hardware, you don't want everybody running the same um, PC, the same hard drive, the same RAM, and Really, we've done a really good job of making sure that people are running on different um, different sort of hardware. It's funny you say that because I would love to see more platforms like, uh, you know, gaming systems and toasters and refrigerators, like porting that to, you know, different ARM style architectures and RISC style architectures. Like that would be that for me, that would be real hardware di diversity. That would be niche nerd stuff. <laughs> My Casio smartwatch. Hey, uh, somebody runs one on a vape. Someone actually runs a validator on a vape. It's kind of cool. I don't know if, if it's maybe it's just a... Okay, now that I said it, it sounds egregious, but I saw it on Twitter. So it, it's real. Yeah, well, it must be true. That's right. Yeah, and then there's geographic diversity. And that, like, geographic and hardware diversity sort of overlap because you don't want everybody running um, in the cloud. Uh, and I think that um, Etherfy likes to tout this one... Uh, this one statistic that some percentage of nodes is run within like the C within like 15 miles of the CIA headquarters. And I think that's because like that's where the um, maybe AWS or some cloud service is reporting. That's where the their CIA runs locations. their nodes. 
Yeah, I think that I think that covers all of the sort of. For you, what is what is geographical is geopolitical social to me. Like that's all three of those together uh, because it's geography, it's political, and it's social collusion. Like these large people colluding together. It's anything that is not hardware or software is geopolitical social. Okay, let's talk about kind of the client diversity because that that's kind of where um, currently the the situation is most dire, right? So basically, you said if I use a super majority client, say I use Geth, which is in excess of like sixty percent or so of the network at the moment, um, as my execution layer client, um, how do I put myself at risk? Can I say first? I don't I don't think it's the most dire. I think that uh, social collusion is currently the most dire, uh, but um, client diversity has the most attention right now. And so, yeah. Okay, let's talk about social collusion next. Um, so the way that you put yourself at risk. So say, so th Geth is actually under, on probably under 66%. And I say probably because our data isn't necessarily um, correct. We sort of have these... Um, we have these probabilities. Um, let, we'll just we'll just leave it like that. Technically, it is impossible to see um, what the actual makeup of the execution layer clients is. It's it's possible to see the consensus layer clients. Um, but so say we're above sixty six percent, and you are running the super majority client. Um, I'm going to name it as a different one because I don't want people to think Geth is a bad client. Like let's say Nethermind is above sixty six percent, and I'm running Nethermind, and Nethermind has a bug where they um, they actually sign something that's incorrect and they finalize it because it looks correct because if 66% of the network signs something that looks correct to them, they're going to continue on and it's going to take a while to figure out what's happening because what it's going to look like is that the minority clients are going to look like they're missing attestation, like they did something wrong. And so the supermajority client is going to finalize to an incorrect chain. And once the supermajority fi uh, client finalizes to an incorrect chain, you can't come back. You can't, you're, you, you essentially are slashed for 100% of your stake. You can lose all 32 ETH because you can't come back from that. What would, uh, what's more likely to happen is there would be some bug where you just stopped attesting. Um, and so uh, that's like sort of the second situation. You stop attesting. It's very clear that the super majority client is having an issue because the whole network stops finalizing. And that's finalizing, not progressing. So people are still able to make transactions, but they're getting reorged after two or three blocks. And that means that like uh, reorging is like uh, the, the, your transactions can be reverted. And so that would be, it, realistically, what would happen is the, the devs would spring into action and um, there would be a fix put out within a couple of hours. But what happens in that situation is that something kicks in called the um, inactivity leak. And that's, um, that is, the purpose of that is to drain these validators so that they represent a smaller portion of the network and the network can start finalizing as quickly as possible again. Um, and so if you are in the supermajority client in that situation, your validator starts getting drained at a higher rate because it's trying to get you off of the network. So either way, in these two scenarios, there's a third scenario that's even less um, that's even less severe than that. But in those two scenarios, you are the you are your capital is being lost. And um, in that more severe scenario where you've lost 32 ETH, all of a sudden, this is a whole network wide issue because the people who lost their stake, who lost 32 ETH, um, who right now are going to be 30% of the the network, they're, well, 30% of 30 of the portion that is staked, um, are going to be fighting to say, you know what? Let's fork. Let's fork and um, let's let's remove this thing that happened and um, pretend that I didn't get slashed, or let's fix this in some other way. And then you have the code is law people versus like the social consensus issue people. Um, and the whole network is thrown into this. Do you remember when the DAO um, hack happened and it was like a, a big issue? So you basically have this situation again where um, I couldn't see being a business like um, an accounting business and saying like, 
this is the network I trust. Like the, it would throw things into such contention that I'm sure businesses would be like, this is this is not a serious um, financial system. We can't we can't um, run a business on this because um, it's it's a mess. So, Superfus, you said um, that you are most worried not about the client diversity issue. But you're most w worried about kind of the social political kind of uh, collusion scenario. This is something I haven't really talked publicly about, um, but I feel like client diversity was a very big deal a year or two ago. Um, right now, there is tremendous awareness about it. We have we're over the hump. There's enough awareness that. Um, if if we continue at our current pace, client diversity, I don't want to say it's going to take care of itself. It's still going to take a lot of effort, but the inertia is there. Uh, the real My real concern about uh, the success of the network now is primarily social. It's not geographical or political yet. It is social, and that is the idea of um, power seeking, which is natural. And I'd have no difficulty with power seeking. I expect it in something this large. Uh, but if any of those power seekers are successful, um, especially in what I consider this the use of Ethereum, then it could have very, very long-term consequences. Uh, and I'm careful not, not to name names other, you know, other than what I've already said, but it really just takes an entity or two entities to say, hey, uh, we don't we don't want this proposal that Nixa was talking about to go forward. Uh, that would harm our bottom line in the long run. So let's just have a back channel here where we talk about how we can shape and influence governance to make sure that what we want is advanced. And then they, you know, kind of put some money into it. Maybe they have researchers that they're funding and the the conclusions of that research tends to support uh, their foundations um, or I, I call them mercenary researchers uh, or they they are researchers for hire who will uh, inevitably come to the conclusion that the payee wants them to find um, and they can be pretty compelling and pretty loud and so that kind of social collusion to me is the the our biggest current threat and it's it's difficult because it's it's hidden uh, and you don't always know about it. And you may never know about it. In fact, really effective social collusion is something you'll never know about. It looks organic. It looks like something that the community wanted to happen. Um, and so the way to prevent that kind of social collusion is to get as many uh, independent individual operator validators everywhere in the world uh, so that they're all thinking for themselves. They're all saying, hmm, is this good for Ethereum? Is this good for my stake? Uh, or is this uh, is this serving some other entity? But isn't that just protocol lobbyism? So because we see that kind of like in, in politics outside of, uh, you know, Ethereum and staking and so on anyway. So how do you think um, we can... Um, create a staking ecosystem where that isn't a factor if it seems like it's something that naturally emerges in these uh, in these situations. Yeah, to call it uh, simple protocol lobbyism, I think is a underestimation of of the threat um, because these entities are, I don't want to make them nebulous, but they're like chameleons. They can appear to be anyone they want. They can come into a forum and say, I'm a homestaker and this is how I feel uh, and this is why I don't want this to happen. I am I guess I'm most concerned because of the nebulous and chameleon nature of the threat that I feel like it's probably already bigger than we've acknowledged. And I do think it is far more significant than just protocol lobbying. I think it is large entities who are willing to collude to get what they want. I think that money can be a powerful motivator to get things done. And so I do think that like lobbying can sort of be um, pushed in. It can be guided in a in a beneficial direction. I think that um, these these p companies with financial interests can reasonably and valuably contribute to research. But I think that there needs to be um, a neutral 
a neutral sort of body who um, is the layer between that financial interest and the people who are actually doing the analysis. Like that's what universities are. That's what um, research in general has always been. There's always been this neutral entity in between the people who want the research done and um, the people who the research benefits versus the people who are um, doing the analysis and um, can be swayed sort of to uh, lean, to, to have biases towards uh, some outcomes. Um, so I think I don't I don't think it's impossible for um, companies with financial interest to valuably uh, contribute to research. I do think that that's possible. But if you kind of look at a research that we've seen come out in the past, so things like smoking is really good for you or best you can put into your body is like three Big Macs a day or something. I mean, obviously, there have been researchers who've published these sorts of studies, usually it then turns out that they were, surprise, surprise, financed by uh, Big Tobacco or McDonald's, whatever. Um, so, uh, I mean, how do you, and I mean, researchers actually have to disclose their financial interests, right, if they have them. So how do you see that kind of play out here? Um, I think that we should leave science to the scientists. Like, I don't think that um, that a p company should be bringing in-house like a bunch of researchers who say like, okay, we want you to study this and we bring your results to us and we will give you advice on how it's going and then we'll look over the drafts and um, then we'll publish it from our research wing. I think that um, they should go to, um, e to uh, ec economy departments in um, universities and say, Uh, we want um, to set up a $1 million dollar grant for anybody who wants to study the intersection of computer science and economy. Um, and we're going to be hands off about it. You guys decide who gets this funding. You de decide which, which PhD students want to study this. Um, and I think that that's possible. And I think that if you look back at like nebu or, uh, dubious research that's been done on like a glass of wine a day is good for you, um, that you'll probably see that The, um, there there weren't very good there weren't very good practices put in place and I I have I don't know I don't have anything specific about that but I I'm betting that that was not um, those were not um, very well respected methods um, with those with those studies <laughs> I I love that you brought that one up because that belief still persists once you once you put the money and effort into promoting that kind of belief um, even after it's debunked it still has Uh, it still pervades Because culture. Because it's nice and to believe. People... Yeah. It's like, it's, <laughs> yeah. I want to believe that too. Glass of red wine per day. I really think it's two drinks. Count Three drinks. Here. It's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just being healthy. <laughs> yeah. Like, absolutely. How much do you think um, this is a war that kind of has to be won on, won on um, culture? I mean, so kind of, should we kind of just establish kind of, this is kind of what we believe in as stakers. You shouldn't delegate to like large staking pools. So if you delegate, kind of delegate to your friend, don't delegate to like um, the, the protocol that already holds 30%. Um, or do you think this is something that kind of has to be put into rules, into like actual hard-coded rules? It's never going to work to to um, make it like a social consensus because the reality is, is 95% of people, maybe even higher, maybe 99% of people who come into crypto, they're just throwing their dart at the wall. They're just hoping for um, the, they're just hoping to invest in the, in the Google of um, 2000 and trying to make it big. And like, if you think about it, that's what crypto has done. It's, it's had big, big talk about like becoming a, global banking a global financial system that's accessible to everybody but like if you put people who make a uh, dollar a day in the same room as the people who make like ten thousand dollars a day there's going to be um this hustle culture that comes from one side and y I, you can't blame them you can't stop that you can't be like you should be more ideological because it's like <laughs> they're trying to survive um and gambling will always happen so i do think that um Crypto in general has been this idea of how do we take greed and um, how do we take normal human, normal human vices and uh, use them, guide them, and make it so that those things are incorporated into a protocol rather than having to fight against it and having to tell people to like uh, 
be the on the the losing end of a, a prisoner's dilemma. Like I think that we should we should try to account for human behavior rather than fight human behavior. I love that. I think those are actually really nice parting words. So if people kind of want to get um, involved in the East Acre community or kind of want advice on how to set up and so on, how do they find you guys? Uh, our website is eastacre.cc. Um, the Discord is really um, active and the subreddit is really active if you're more into Reddit than Discord. Um, people love people who come in and if you come in and say, hey, I'm, I'm interested in staking, how do I start this? People love to help. Fantastic. Then uh, let, let's let's see whether uh, we get any new stakers interested. Um, it's definitely a super interesting um, community. It's kind of, to me, it's always... Um, reminiscent of kind of you you know kind of the maker communities i mean not not like crypto maker but kind of like the people who like tinker with stuff it's, it's that kind of people who kind of end up in those and and they're 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 fun people they're good people there's a big overlap too <laughs> <laughs> cool and it's actually it's really interesting because uh to be in the community you kind of have to have some skin in the game you don't have to we have people who don't stake at all but, you know, many people have 32 Ether, many people have 1 Ether, um, and you also have to have some interest in the long-term success of Ethereum. And so putting those two things together, and I'm not saying it's everyone, but a vast majority of the people have something at stake and they have an interest in Ethereum. It makes for a really interesting um, group of people who are, are really fun to engage with. And there's also some pr pride that kind of goes along with it. I mean, basically, if you go to conferences and talk about staking, people who stake, they talk about this with pride. Like it's it's like a part of their identity and kind of like self-description, how they see themselves, right? How do you know if someone's a solo staker? They'll tell they'll you. Tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. It's been a pleasure having both of you on. And uh, yeah, keep, keep us on our toes. Uh, you're keeping us honest here as the ecosystem. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you so much, Federico.